There's something strange going on with Surinamese restaurants in Amsterdam. If you didn't know, Suriname is a country in South America. Surinamese restaurants are a Dutch favorite. You can find super tasty food that compares very well to traditional Dutch cuisine. But almost none of these restaurants are classified as Surinamese only. You can find Surinamese Chinese, Indian and Javanese style. That's weird. Look at this map of Suriname and Java, the most populous province of Indonesia. They are a whopping 18,500 kilometers apart. Everyone that has been to Indonesia knows about the great food. And Surinamese, Japanese food is in many ways very similar. This is Pichel, it's, um, also from Indonesia. But there is a difference. Uh, Pakabana, fried banana with peanut sauce. In Indonesia, they don't, do not combine this, so it's very strange. And there is a dark reason for this. So how did the Surinamese culinary fusion come into being? Why can you find so much of these restaurants in the Netherlands? How did we get here? If you go to a Surinamese, Chinese, Javanese, or Indian restaurant, you can find a ton of different culinary influences. To help explain, I've asked two friends. Janunku Rizki, my name is Rizki. Rizki and I met on the internet. He is of Indonesian descent. And I've asked my amazing barber. Gabriela Oosibi. And she has Surinamese parents. The food combines rice, vegetables, meat and fish, both fresh and salty. Cassava with salted cod. Pakabana, fried banana with peanut sauce. Bara, this is from uh, Indian origin. It's a donut with spices. Pechel is um, vegetables with peanut sauce. Yeah, so this is a salto soup, so it's a chicken soup. Pom, and this is one of the few uh, original South American uh, dishes. Right, well, let's dig in. <laughs> but there's a dark background to this culinary fusion. A history about slavery, contract labor in terrible conditions, and maintaining your culture in this adversity. So, let's dive in. For the start of the story, we have to go back all the way to the 1600s. The Dutch want to be independent of the Spanish kingdom. They are at war with both Spain and Portugal. And the Dutch, they have suffered some near-death experiences. And to fight back, they need to hit their enemies where it hurts the most, the South American colonies. This is where the Spanish are getting silver and the Portuguese are making a lot of money in the sugar trade. The Dutch actually managed to hijack a Spanish fleet of silver. And this gives them the money for an invasion force. With this, they attack Portuguese sugar plantations in Brazil. Sugar is a very valuable resource that fetches huge prices in the European markets. But this sugar trade has a dark side, because sugar is won by cutting and processing sugar cane, a dangerous process that is done by slaves. Portuguese abduct people from Africa. The Dutch had actually criticized the Spanish because of their involvement in the slave trade. But when they needed to make money themselves from these sugar plantations, they set aside their moral issues. They occupy a Portuguese base in Ghana and traffic people back to their colonies in Brazil, a trip where almost 20% of the enslaved people died. They use the same ships to transport the sugar that the slaves make back to Europe. The Dutch eventually lose their colony in Brazil, when later, when fighting the English, they occupy their colony of Suriname. And this becomes a destination of many of the captured Africans that work on the plantations. Because, well, you can also grow sugar in Suriname. In the 1600s, the Dutch are actually the third biggest slave traders. In total, it is estimated that the Dutch abducted 5,500 women, men and children from Africa. Slavery is eventually abolished due to examples of rebellion in Haiti, resistance on local plantations and the work of English abolitionists. But where the English actually abolished slavery in 1833, it took another 30 years for the Dutch to end it. And when they did it, it didn't go great. Look at this message. It's from the Dutch king abolishing slavery. The first three points are very important. The first point proclaims the end of slavery. Very good, but it goes downhill from there. The second point talks about the money plantation owners will get for the loss of their slaves. 300 guilders or about 3,500 euros in our time. 
Oh, and yes, the plantation owners complained that it wasn't enough. They wanted 500 guilders. Okay, right, time for the third point. This actually stipulates that the former slaves have to work for 10 more years. So these people that were just freed celebrated their independence. The next day, they had to go back to the same plantations and the same owners to work. So much for abolition. This period of staatstoezicht is why some people in the Netherlands prefer to put the end of slavery at 1873 instead of 1863. So the end of slavery is there. Awesome. But the end of slavery also explains the Surinamese Javanese kitchen. Let me explain. With the end of slavery, plantation owners actually are looking at a big problem. They have a workforce for the coming 10 years, but after that, who's gonna work on their plantations? Well, they already looked to China to get some laborers, but that was not really a great success. So they take inspiration from their neighbors. The English had abolished slavery already 30 years earlier, and they had some experience with contracting laborers from India. So the Dutch negotiated a deal to get indentured laborers from India. These people were told of great working conditions, free healthcare and a very good climate. But they actually ended up on the same plantations in the same barracks as the slaves had been. Plantation owners could actually use penal sanctions to punish their own workers. Plantation owners gave their workers harsh penalties for a lot of things. Anything from losing a tool to carelessness and laziness. And they also bound the workers to a specific plantation. 20% of contract laborers died of exertion on the job. That's not so different from slavery after all, is it? Well, the Dutch government didn't feel comfortable to be reliant on a deal with the English alone. So after working with the British, they focused on shipping laborers from their own colony, the Dutch Indies. Parts of Indonesia had actually been in Dutch hands since the 1600s. And that's a dark story in its own right for another time. Colonialism really brings out the best in people, right? Java was the most populous part of Indonesia, so they got laborers from there as well. So between 1873 and 1939, a total of 34,000 British Indians and 33,000 Japanese contract laborers were sent to Suriname. This makes Suriname a very diverse country, even to this day. In a 2012 census, Surinamese people identified as Indo-Surinamese, as Maroon, that's people that are descended of runaway slaves that lived in the jungle, Creole, Javanese, multiracial, Amerindian, Chinese, and even a part European. Coming to Suriname, the Chinese, Hindu, and Japanese indentured laborers brought their customs and culinary traditions. They introduced rice and flatbread. And so for Gabriela, this is what she grew up with. Everything what you see here, my parents make for me, for us. And uh, better, of course. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. That still doesn't explain why you find the food in the Netherlands. In 1975, Suriname was granted independence. And a lot of Surinamese people from different backgrounds came to the Netherlands. Nowadays, there's about 350,000 people of Surinamese descent that live in the Netherlands. That's quite a lot, considering that there are actually 566,000 Surinamese in Suriname. When they arrived in the Netherlands, Surinamese, Javanese and Hindu immigrants opened the first Surinamese restaurants. This is a time where you can find almost no Surinamese food in the Netherlands. And so these joints are very popular with afro surinamese as it reminded them of home. They also added a new touch to the cuisine in the Netherlands. So in the end, Surinamese food is a great example of how colonialism, forced migration and culinary culture are intertwined. I've been to this restaurant like all my life. The food is so similar to Indonesian food, but also like a little bit more exotic. So you can also have like the Indian um, roti. If people are new to the Netherlands and also Surinamese food, I always take them to Surinamese restaurant because you can get everything. And Surina Suriname is like a melting pot of different cultures. So you have a lot of food from everywhere. Yeah. So and it's delicious. And delicious. it's very, very good. Yeah, we shouldn't uh, forget, uh, forget that. Spong. Spong. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to know more about how culture defines your entire workday, every day, be sure to click on this video, where I explain how the eight hour workday is a right won by workers. And that's also something that's not really suited for your work anymore.